Hello. This week we're going to be talking about working with parents and families, uh, primarily working with parents, and the role that we play in supporting parents um, to be with us as a team that will implement the best strategies possible to support their children. Working with families, to me, and parents in particular, has been one of the most rewarding parts of my career. I love working with parents. I would say, though, that's not always been the case. When I first began, um, I was actually rather intimidated by parents. I was afraid that they would think I didn't know what I was talking about or that, um, you know, that I believed that my role was to usurp them as parents. I really struggled with how to give parents information that I felt would be difficult for them to hear. And it took me a lot of time and a lot of practice to be comfortable in my role in working with parents. So I hope that um, through the reading and the, um, the exercise that you're going to do, the prompts that you're going to respond to, you might have a better sense of parents and of your own role in working with parents uh, to be successful in a special education setting. Let me begin with the fact that all parents and all families are unique. Don't make assumptions about how the parent might be responding to a child with a disability prior to their arrival. My point is this. In my experience, I have seen families who have children who are extraordinarily challenging, and the family just regroups and moves on as if it were just like a minor blip on the screen. I've seen other families who have children who, for all intents and purposes, are really quite typical, but the little differences or the things that need extra support overwhelm the family, and they have a very difficult time getting themselves organized around how to support this child effectively and knowing and feeling comfortable with their role as a parent in doing so. The text talks about family systems theory, and it's a good framework to understand how things work for a family, specifically as we look at disability. The best way I know to describe family systems theory is taking a stone or a pebble and throwing it into a pond. If you do that, you know that you're going to get this ripple effect in the pond or in the water. The job of the family system is to find homeostasis, which means that the ripple goes this way and the role of the family is to bring it back together and to make things copacetic again. So things come together and in a comfortable arrangement, the family regroups to become the family as they define themselves. So we know, based upon family systems theory, that disability does have an impact on the family and we do have to look at that in particular as it relates to parents and the ways that they interact with the school to support their child in the educational process. Another thing that I would like you to think about is that in my experience families are far more resilient than we give them credit for. Families will say to me a lot of times, especially after an IEP meeting, that they feel like the schools pathologize them. You know, it's like this poor family who can't get it together, or it's these poor parents who don't know what they're doing, or if you just done this or you just do that, things would be this way or that way. They would give you the outcome for that. And families feel very defeated by that. So when we think about families, we also want to start with the concept that they are resilient, they can be resilient, they will be resilient, and our job is to actually support resiliency rather than overacting on the family to achieve goals and outcomes. We also want to think about how the family chooses to utilize us. <clears throat> In some families, you'll see that they believe the educator is the expert and basically what the educator says is what they should be doing. In other families, they're highly suspicious of any outside, or outsider, I should say, coming into the family unit and giving advice or offering ways that the family could reorganize or parenting strategies could be changed to support the child. 
the purpose of doing that kind of assessment is looking at how you think the family would like you to be in order for them to utilize you in the most effective way possible. What I have found in my work with families is that if I just sit back for a little bit and I watch the way the family interacts with me, I can pretty quickly get a sense of what they want from me. But I have to wait and I have to listen. The hardest thing for me when I started was I would take my anxieties and, and, and fears and my reservations about working with families and I would overact. I would start giving lots of suggestions, lots of things to do. Let's think of this, let's think of that, whatever. Now when I sit with a family, one of the first things I do is listen. And I ask questions like, how do you see me being involved with you? How do you see my role in your family? Another question that I like to ask that families always tell me they appreciate is I say, what have you been doing already that's working? Let me know what you're doing so we can do it too. To come together in an alliance with the family means that we have to sit back and look at this family like a blank slate. We don't know yet who they are until they tell us who they are. So we can't make the assumption that because they have a child with a very challenging behavior, that that therefore means one, two, three, A, B, C. It may or may not mean that. Sit and listen with the family. Sit and understand the family. Let them come to you with who they are so that we know how to respond uh, more appropriately. Another piece that I want you to think about is the power differential. And I think this has everything to do with what gets in the way sometimes of our effective work with families. As you will see from the article by Turnbull and her colleagues, uh, we've made quite an evolution from the old days when I started in special education to where we are now. In the old days, we were supposed to be the experts and give the family the information and they were supposed to be delighted that they had us in their lives because we were going to tell them what to do. We've moved all the way now to something called collective empowerment in which we work with parents to create the synergy around goal development, realizing the hopes and dreams of the family for their child and the ways that we as educators can join with them to make them able to realize the things that they want for their child and for their child's participation in the school setting. That is somewhat hard to do because we come from a notion that we need to act upon families rather than act with families. And it's a really difficult, to me, it's a difficult kind of um, paradigm shift because I've always been the one who was supposed to be in charge. That's how I was trained, seriously, back in the day. It took me a while to feel comfortable giving up my power, and I hate to admit that because I don't think I thought of it as power, but it took me a while to give up my power to the families. I give all my power to the families now. I'm not kidding. I don't mean that I don't have a job to do. I don't mean that... Um, I, I, I don't draw boundaries or, or set limits. I don't mean that I am afraid to give my opinion about something. But what I mean is this. It's your child. It's your son or daughter. It's their future. It's your future. It's not mine. And so therefore, I really just sit back and let the families have the power. I don't mean this in a, manip a manipulative way, and I hope it doesn't sound that way. But what I have found is that when I let families have the power, gosh, that might even sound bad, let them. When I back down and let families take the lead, let's put it that way, right? But that is a shift in the power differentials. We think about it between professionals and families. When I let them do that, I find that they generally give me far more power after that kind of interaction than I would have ever had before. Now, by power, I don't mean it in a negative sense of power. I mean it in the sense that they give me a lot of leeway to make decisions, to try things out, to um, give them feedback that might be difficult. They make far more space for that 
when I allow them to be in the driver's seat and I don't try to take that over as my own because it is not my place. It is the place of the family. In my work in schools, that idea about the power differential has been really a big one. You know, how do we get the family to sign the IEP? Or why are they arguing with us about this? Or didn't we tell them that? It becomes a, a, a adversarial stance. And if you go back to the idea that the power is not ours, never was ours to begin with, you free up a lot of energy to be able to work with families in a better way. And that's been my experience and one that I really value. Because now when families come to me, no matter how they come, I'm able to start with them as a blank slate, let them illustrate for me or demonstrate for me how they view things for themselves as a family and how they want me to be involved or not involved. It's an important trait for us to pay attention to that our own need for power in a relationship is often exacerbated by technic by crisis or by the kinds of interactions that become negative or the pressures of the administration whatever it tends to promote our need for power and control the more you give that up with families the more they'll give it right back to you and i can tell you that based upon my experience it happens every time um one of the things that i i placed in the um the reading um, is actually just a simple uh, overview of the work of Ellen Galinsky um, is about the stages of parenting. And until I read her work, I never thought of image making as being a stage of parenting, but it is. Before parents have a child, even before they're pregnant, they're thinking about who their child will be, what their child will be like, how, what kind of parents they will become. And all of that dreaming and all of those images that are being created are things that sustain the family in moving forward and having a child. In, by the way, we all do it. I'm not a parent, but I have many times dreamt about the kind of child I would have had or children I would have had, what kind of father I would be. I do those things quite often, and most of us do, because we can really relate to the idea of bringing someone into the world and how that would impact both us and how we might impact that child. So parents go through quite um, a lot of image making. When the child comes into the world, then they have to reconcile the reality of that child with their images. In the case of disability, that can sometimes become uh, rather difficult because if, for example, the family, you know, has always the family has always been uh, they all went to Harvard there's a whole line of Harvard graduates and um, that's been an important piece of the family is that every first generation child has gone to Harvard and then the child is born with significant cognitive disabilities there's a whole reconciling between what that was dreamt what is and how the family would work to re to reorganize their understanding of their child and their family based upon the reality of the child after the image making has occurred i su i um submit that the image making process especially when it comes to working with children who have disabilities, is not only significant in the beginning, but I think it's significant throughout um, the child's participation uh, in the school setting. Um, and by that, I mean the way that families envision that their children would, should perform in school, and it does not meet up to that kind of expectation that they've set, causes real issues for them and potential tensions between them and the teachers. That's why I always think it's important to go back and think about the disconnect maybe between what families imagined and where we are today in this situation. I've also found that when I pay attention to the idea of image making, um, it helps me be more uh, considerate when families seem unrealistic or the big dreaded D word for families, they're in denial. When we hear that, families don't like it because they think denial means we're taking away hope, and I would agree with that. However, 
when you see something that just seems so unrealistic and you think to yourself, how could this family think that? You might want to go back to image making and thinking that it takes time for all of us to give up something that we believe in, that we want desperately, that we value. It takes us time to give that up. And I think oftentimes that's what we're experiencing with families in school is they're still giving up in many ways the image of their child. Um, the other thing about the image making and, and the way that it gets punctuated throughout the school years is about the stages that families go through. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but many families will say to you that they revisit that um, image um, or shattered image maybe is a better way to put it. They revisit that um, through different stages of the child's development. For example, um, when a child goes to uh, kindergarten, let's just say, and they're placed in a specialized program setting, and the family, you know, really was looking forward to the first day they went to kindergarten, they were looking forward to the ways things were going to happen, and instead of it being the typical experience that they had dreamt about, they're dealing with all kinds of issues with service providers, people who are trying to figure out how to keep the child um, active if they're in a wheelchair, etc. And so the whole experience of what kindergarten looked like in their minds is not the way kindergarten is turning out to be. It's the same thing when, you know, they're in high school and all the kids are going to the homecoming or the prom and their son or daughter is not getting the invitation. Those kinds of things repunctuate or maybe punch the card of image making again so that families have to revisit that over and over again. That's why I've asked you to look at image making because I just think it's a fascinating way to look at families from the beginning and then think, wow, this is sort of how this played out over a longer period of time. Um, the other thing that I want you to think about in particular is about how we have now moved, hopefully, uh, to collective empowerment as a model. When the article by Turnbull and her colleagues talk about collective empowerment, they're talking about an evolution from the oldest model, which is what I was trained in, which is that special educators are the experts and we are there to tell you basically how to raise your child. And if you just listen to us, that'll work out. Um, to what is now joining with families. And if we join with families in working together in which both of us share the quote power. I, I don't like the word exactly, but I do think in the human condition, it comes down to you know who has the power. If we share the power, we find that through a collective empowerment, we're able to both work collaboratively, collaboratively, sorry, to ensure that we are together and aligned in setting goals, in creating interventions, in, in understanding um, our views of shared outcomes. That's the way that it happens. And to be able to get there, it means that often we have to adapt ourselves as special educators and as schools and as school teams to be able to work um, within that model with comfort. I can tell you from working in a lot of schools, it's still not there yet. I will see um, uh, professionals, teaching professionals and others, um, in my estimation, sort of talking down to families like they don't understand something, they don't get something, or they have to make sure they understand it or know it, when the family is just not on board with it. That's a failure of collective empowerment. Collective empowerment means that we not only respect each other for our roles and expertise, but it means that everything brought to the table is meaningful and it needs to be thought of in that way and then organized in a format that works best for everyone involved, but most especially for the child. I would encourage you when you read that article to pay attention to the old days, as it were, because we still have too many of the old days going on in our school systems. And I'd like you to think about, well, how is it that I could be a different presence with families? And I'll give you one way I think that could happen. The one thing that I changed, um, I don't know how early on in my career, 
But I was lucky enough to have um, someone who was a supervisor of my work who said to me, you need to stop talking at families. You need to talk with families. I was kind of offended. <laughs> I really was. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, well, you, you need to start talking with them. She goes, you're just kind of, you talk at them. Like, well, here's another thing, and here's another thing, and here's another thing. If I can encourage you to do anything, that is have a conversation with the family, a conversation. Conversations are two-way, and they don't usually have a lot of, um, you know, this is what you should do in them. Conversations are usually give and take, and we try to form shared understandings and shared meanings and that kind of thing. And that's what I've learned to do with families is have a conversation. If you start looking at your work with families as an ongoing conversation, you will be so much better off. I literally, and I don't mean this boastfully, but I literally had um, a mother that I talked with um, who after our first meeting, she said to me, this was so nice to meet with you. And she goes, you're the first social worker. I was horrible to hear this. You're the first social worker who hasn't talked down to me. You talked with me. And that's kind of when I knew I'd gotten there. I was like, really? Oh, okay, cool. But it took quite a while because it's just something about, well, I'm supposed to know something and I'm supposed to tell something and I'm supposed to give you this information. There's something in us that makes us want to do that. So to sit back, be quiet, listen, reflect with the parent, you're going to find that the alignment that you're seeking or searching for will come to you so much more quickly. And that is the goal that I hope that all of you will take on is how it is that you would work with families in a way that they are allowed to be who they are and they are allowed to share what they want. They're allowed to change their mind when they want to um, from the standpoint that it's their journey and we're there only providing some, you know, road markers, mile markers along the way to help them be able to define that journey for themselves. When families are able to do that for themselves, when parents are able to do that for them, themselves, they feel far more confident and far more capable of working with their, chi with their children themselves or with their child with a disability themselves, but also they feel far more competent at becoming interdependent with the school team, which is really what we want. We want them to utilize us when they need, and they want we want them to be able to go on their own and be effective without us around. And what's really the ultimate goal is we hope that they can move even from interdependent to independent in terms of supporting their son or daughter uh, with a disability. I've mentioned a couple times about usurping um, uh, families. So I'm going to end with a story that um, was really just to me it was one of those like mind-blowing i wish i had a video when i was there um but you read in the at the chapter about ifsps um the individual family service plans and i'm sorry the chapter didn't go into more detail and i can't recall honestly if there's more in the the text about the ifsp but those plans are for children from birth to three um, and it's like the IEP, but for that, for that young population. And one of the things that makes it different is that you begin the IFSP process by asking about the hopes and dreams um, of the family for their child, which I think is lovely, by the way. It's like the image-making stage. What, is, what, is, what are your hopes and what are your dreams? Well, to make a long story short, I had gone to see a family, and they were pretty angry. We had, we had dumped them in the system by accident, something got lost and we didn't get to them for like three months after their child was born and we should have been there a lot earlier. So I, I always felt like, you know, I already felt like, I mean, I was in the doghouse before I got there. Um, anyway, I started with the hopes and dreams. The family seemed a little, you know, not into me or anything else. I just say that because they weren't real happy and we get to the hopes and dreams. And, um, I said to the father, you know, what are your hopes and dreams for your son? And he said, I would like him to be a quarterback for Notre Dame. Okay, so I said, um, okay, and I got ready to write down that he, you know, would be a quarterback for Notre Dame. And the dad said, um, well, I mean, 
Well, he did. He doesn't have to be. And I said, well, and I, I like college football. So what I said was this: Notre Dame had just lost uh, in a game, like in in overtime, as I recall. But anyway, it was I, I don't know why, but it was Florida State um, that he that had beaten Notre Dame. Um, and I, I'd seen the game. So I said, well, here's the problem with your goal. I go, he'll probably be an idiot and play for Florida State. And the dad just started laughing because you watch college football. I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, man, that was terrible. You know, we kind of laughed about it. I said, so going back to the hopes and dreams, I said, so you want your son to be a quarterback? And he said to me, and it was so profound, I know, oh, I didn't mention their son had was born with Down syndrome. He said, um, I know that my son is not going to be a quarterback for Notre Dame. And he said, but that's for me to decide and not you. Don't you ever tell me what my son can or cannot do, what he will or won't do. That's for me to decide and not you. It was very profound. I took it out because he told me to. But when he put it in there, I realized it was a test. It was to see if I was going to be the typical, well, I think that's kind of an inappropriate goal. You know, you've heard that. Or if I was going to listen to him as a father and I was going to listen to what his hopes and dreams were. Once I understood what his hopes and dreams were, it also helped me understand image making. I was able to look at that and go, wow, this is a really broken image. You know, it was a guy who really probably wanted his son to throw the football around with and hoped he went and played, you know, hopefully good enough to get into college football. And here's a child with gross motor deficits, fine motor deficits, will have no um, ability to come close to what his dreams were for his son in that area. But I wouldn't have known any of that if I had decided to take the approach that I would talk him out of that or that anything that he had to say to me was not worth being listened to because I had all the evidence as to why something wouldn't happen. You get the point. What I'm saying is if you engage in conversations with families and you allow that to unfold and you allow the kinds of conversations to come forward that help the family become comfortable with you, it will happen because you have let yourself be open to hearing everything about them while suspending judgment and while holding back on giving any kind of feedback that you feel might be important, but at that time is not important for them. So you hold on to that and you wait until they're ready for it. And in my experience, families let you know when they're ready. In a sense, they ask for it and you'll know when that happens. And that's always the best relationship that you can have. So I hope that uh, by looking at the assignment, you'll get some ideas about ways that you can be more effectively engaged in families, uh, to look at yourself and what your role is um, in this endeavor that is so important to our field. And from that, you'll have a better understanding both of the family's place or the parent's place in the special education process and the ways and means that you can be most effective in supporting their efforts and the efforts of the school district on behalf of the child. Thanks.